here we're getting to our first actual worry, our first thing to really think about. Uh, and that would be our good friend here. Well, actually, no, we'll do one thing first, which is right now that little green line on the if statement. Before we get to that one, uh, the yeah. if statement, the green line, this isn't mandatory, but it's another piece of good practice, right? That's going to tell you you can invert it. That's what that green line will say. So if you if you go over to that if and expand it out, it will tell you invert if, and it does this. Now, what this does is it tells you that you had an if statement where there wasn't the else portion. So what you could do is it turns into a guard clause. You're basically saying, I can take this and I can just exit out because nothing else runs past this point. If, if this is not true, or in this case, if it's the opposite of <laughs> what you're doing, uh, if you shouldn't assemble, then ignore it. Don't do anything else beyond this point. And that's just a bit cleaner. It lets you exit sooner and you don't end up with what's called cyclomatic complexity. And that's where you have multiple brackets deep and all of a sudden you have to mentally kind of zigzag your way through your code. So if you if you exit early, you can work on cleaner code step by step, you know? Yeah. So yeah, this, the guard clause is great. I mean, and obviously you want to make sure... So th for me, the having the guard clause and the up in the update method, I always feel a little bit like, oh, well, the update method, you might you might update it later. Ha, you might change it later. And so the update method could do so much more that you, you can't predict because it's so generic. So I always like kind of, I don't want to say shy away, but it always makes, it always feels like a code smell to me when I see it, when I, when I put a guard clause into an update. But I mean, I think in this case. Well, I, well fun fact, actually, bring that up. I do something about that myself, hmm. which is whenever I have a guard clause, what I do is I wrap everything else in the update and I give it a name. So I would, in this case, call this um, update assembling or... Oh, like put it in know, a method? And, and then, you, then you have a guard clause and then the function that's called. And that way you can very clearly see what would happen in the case of it um, hitting past the guard clause. Got it. Cool. All right. So we'll probably end up doing that, but I'm not. let's see what this thing does. Well, you wanted to talk about this, and I think that's pretty... Yeah, this is, this is the first one that everyone should really be aware of, right? And I, I say this a lot because I think we need to make a video on this especially. Uh, I don't think people fully understand what a component model is and how it works. And that basically means a lot of stuff is happening magically by Unity to kind of do things for you. Least of all the update function. We haven't even gotten to magic functions yet. I don't even want to get into that right now. But this call in particular is well worth knowing because people don't think about it. But what that get component does, like I said, imagine you had a stack of books and you want to get a certain book. And someone said, Hey, will you hand me that book? And then the minute you the minute they say, Well, they'll say, Do you have this book? And you would then search the list, get the book, and say, Yes, I have this book. Then you put it back in the stack. And then someone says, Can I have that book? You would then go through it again, find the book, and hand it to them. You're doing the same thing twice arbitrarily that's costing extra cycles. So whenever you call get component, you want to store the value of that so you can get back at it easier. So you would remember where it is and you can refer to it. So if you ever find get component inside of an update loop, what you're basically saying is every time update is called, walk through all the objects. And then every time update's called, walk through the objects again. Now, some people might say there's only one or two components on this object. It's not that much of a walk. Well, there's one or two components now. And somebody might add more later. And also, if you've got 10 items and they're all doing a walk of only two steps, that's still 20 steps. You know, like you're, you're massively scaling that as you go. So get component, cache them in your awake function. Let's do it. Let's cache this baby. Uh, and when Charles is doing that, I'll point out why I said awake function. So here's another interesting point. Based on the application model, they're using a state system, a life cycle that's very similar to, say, Android. And so what I mean by that is every single script starts with, there's a series of steps. And there's awake, and there's start, and then there's loads of them. I don't, I don't get to all of them. But the general point is awake happens, then start happens, then update happens. And what a lot of people don't realize is awake and start happen once for the lifetime of that object. So if we had awake start, on enable, update, on disable. No matter if you toggle that object on and off, what happens is the start will run once, the awake will run once, and the enable will toggle on and off. So it's caching the data for it, and then it's using the data as you go forward. So what you want to do is anytime you want to use objects like this with get components, you do it in awake. And the reason you do it in awake instead of start is every single awake call in your entire application runs before the first start call. So if you've got 50 scripts, and you don't know which things will initialize first and which variables will be set, uh, what you want to do is you want to make sure that all the await calls run so all of your data is cached, and then the next thing to execute will be the start function. So do all of the, the logical bindings in awake, do all of your configuration in start, 